The great American humorist Will Rogers, who was part Indian, is quoted as saying, When Christopher Columbus arrived in America, my family was waiting there to offer a big welcome. Then he added, Later we all wondered if Grandpa hadn't been a bit hasty about the whole thing. Two conflicting cultures going head to head over such fundamental issues as land, religion, and lifestyle. The idea of intercultural harmony got off to a pretty good start. We all know they celebrated the first Thanksgiving together. Then, apparently, something went wrong. In any event, it all went downhill from there. Until about a hundred years ago, very few American Indians could read or write. History was by oral tradition, from one generation to the next. The white man had a slicker system, the printed word, the high-speed press. It was tailor-made adventure. If the facts weren't exciting, make up new ones. If the history wasn't inspiring, rewrite it. And the Indians were the perfect villains. To the early publishers, it was a matter of selling books. Of course, this took on a whole new dimension a few decades later. In the movies, the Indians provided the perfect fall guy. His role as the ruthless heathen allowed the non-Indian settler to usually be viewed as the victim. Just look at Christian Flats. Those redskins have made a ghost town out of it. Here come them red devils, Jack. You mean when the Indians run the whites out of the territory? I'm Tell them to send an army out here. Tell them to dig every Indian out from behind every rock and wipe the war paint off his face with a bullet. Now, how do you feel about the poor, misunderstood Indians? Speak to me, Indian brothers! In the real world, before the Old West movies were invented, attitudes toward Indians weren't necessarily negative. Billy Early, born in 1888, was already a teenager before the first silent movies appeared. Well, yes, I remember uh, people's thoughts and thinking about Indians at that time, uh, though there was not any uh, animosity or anything like that. And mostly what we heard was uh, what we read, what we read and what we were told uh, about uh, the different Indians. They're, most of them were all good Indians, didn't have too much, uh, uh, and we were not taught to be afraid of anything, uh, let alone the Indians. They talk about civilizing the Indians. Uh, that's the word that I have always resented. I don't like uh, the word civilizing us. I think the Indians had their own culture, and at that time they were as civilized as anybody else in this country. I, I don't understand why they have to use the word civilized. It's also interesting to hear the childhood memories of Indian adults. Peterson Zah is the president of the Navajo Nation. The cowboys, I remember at a boarding school, there were a lot of kids who were always hollering, screaming, and uh, rooting for the cowboys because the Indians were always made uh, a bad group. It used to really make me wonder. Uh, it made me... These were the Indian kids, these were Navajo kids, these were Pimas and Hopis and Papagos. Bill Hastings, who is half Cherokee and was raised on a reservation in Oklahoma, is the Indian school superintendent at Fort Apache, Arizona. And as far as the stereotype, most minorities were. If you look at the, uh, the blacks on the movies, the Orientals in the movies, they all had this stereotype and even the Italians, they've all fought against it. It's up to us to change that. We didn't have much say on it being made back then, but it's up for us and the, the children that we're releasing from this school that we're graduating and from the other leaders to change it. But perhaps the stereotype even more negative was that the Indian had no sophistication. Hello, I'm Bill McCune. We probably have more misinformation about Native Americans than any other major ethnic group. 
Our focus in this three-part series is the Indian of the American Southwest, specifically Arizona, the state with the largest native population. Our purpose is to simply tell the story from prehistoric times to the present day in the belief that knowledge is the first step toward tolerance and appreciation of ethnic and cultural diversity. And heaven knows that's a worthy goal. We recognize that in the time allotted, we can offer only a rather fast-paced overview of this rich history, but we hope our effort will inspire future writers and producers to offer more detailed accounts. Now, please stay with us. Peach Springs, Arizona, the Wallapai Reservation. In earlier times, the drums and songs might have struck fear in the non-Indian observer. Unfamiliar sounds, a war chant perhaps. This is part of a modern war. This is a sobriety powwow. If you're feeling good, go feel good at home, in bed. And well, please, uh, if you're partying, go somewhere else. You're not wanted in this uh, arbor or in this area. Representatives of several Arizona Indian tribes have come together for a conference on drug and alcohol abuse. The evening is time for powwow. Wallapai, Quichon, Apache, Hopi, Yavapai, Navajo, dancing together, celebrating, working toward a common goal. Historically, some of these tribes were natural enemies. They would not have danced together. But prehistorically, there are some common ties, a relationship, as all native people on the North and South American continents are believed to have migrated from Asia. Dr. Emil Howery, a world-renowned anthropologist, began his study of prehistoric Arizona in the 1920s. Well, in my view, man first came to Arizona about the same time that he got into the New World from Asia at about uh, 10 to 12 to 15,000 years ago. That subject is debated very extensively, but we do have repetitive evidence of the, let's say, the 12,000 year old date. 12 to 15,000 years ago, the end of the Ice Age, the beginning of the Stone Age, Arizona was cool and wet. Woolly mammoths were hunted by Paleo Indians. With the passage of 20 or 30 centuries, the climate became hotter and drier. The prehistoric elephant died out, replaced by smaller game, early deer and bison. And in southeastern Arizona, there emerged a slightly more advanced people whom we call Cochise Man. With the loss of the big game animals, people had to rely on gathering, gathering vegetable foods from nature uh, to subsist. They had not yet reached an agricultural stage where they planted seeds and harvested what grew. Cochise man lived in Arizona for perhaps 10,000 years, until around the time of Christ. How, or even if they died out, we don't know. But from around the first century, we find evidence of another people, located to the north, near modern-day Payson and Heber, below the Mugion Rim. We call him Mugion Man. Well, we know that they were, they lived in semi-subterranean houses beginning agriculturists, but at a relatively primitive, poor level. We know that they developed villages, large villages. We know that they had domestic structures and that they had religious structures. It is believed that around the year 1000 AD, the Mugion were absorbed into the more dominant and more sophisticated culture called the Anasazi. The Anasazi lived in what today is the Four Corners area and broadly through the Colorado Plateau and beyond. They're best known for their multi-story pueblos. That was their contribution architecturally. And they were also agriculturists. They learned how to master the arid environment, which it's difficult to grow corn in this country, but they did it. They grew cotton, grew corns, 
the corn, beans, and squash. Today, spectacular Anasazi ruins may be seen and visited at Canyon de Chez and at the Navajo National Monument, as well as at the Grand Canyon and the Petrified Forest. Certainly the best known of our prehistoric people are the Hohokam. Today, some two and a half million people reside on some of the same real estate that they lived on. The city of Phoenix is named for the mythical bird that rose from its own ashes. In this case, the ashes of Hohokam villages. Their territory extended well beyond modern Arizona. They could be found virtually to the Mexican border. They developed significant communities, the ruins or sites of which today go by such names as Pueblo Grande, Snake Town, Mesa Grande, Los Muertos, and Casa Grande. The Hohokam participated in sports. Sizable playing courts have been found, and even a preserved rubber ball was discovered near Casa Grande. The presence of seashells suggests that they engaged in trade with people as far away as the California coast. But of course, the Hohokam are best known for their sophisticated agriculture, made possible by the construction of some 300 miles of canals, carrying water from the Salt River to fields as far as 20 miles away. And that, I think, was contributory to the richness of their culture, it gave them the freedom the freedom of time from other duties to develop a very ample and uh, rich uh, cultural, cultural attributes. It is pretty much agreed that Hohokam had thousands of acres under cultivation. But what is debated is why they went away. Even the word Hohokam in the Pima Indian language means those who have gone, or another more insightful definition is all used up. Well, before we speculate on it, we need to recognize that it wasn't just the Hohokam who were here in the early 1400s. We've mentioned the Anasazi who had largely absorbed the Mugion people, but there were others as well. East and north of Phoenix, extending as far as the modern city of Globe, were the Salado, or Salt River people. They were farmers who also built sizable cliff dwellings in Pueblos, some of which can be seen today at the Tonto National Monument near Roosevelt Dam. And at Globe, where the Gila Pueblo ruins were in 1920, reconstructed so thoroughly and soundly that the 57-room building today actually houses Gila Pueblo Community College, which in a sense makes it the oldest college in the Western Hemisphere. There were the Sanawa, or volcano people, who lived first in the area around Flagstaff, then expanded south through Oak Creek and finally into the Verde Valley, where there are numerous small Pueblo and cliff-dwelling ruins. The best known of these are Montezuma Castle, which had nothing to do with the Aztec leader Montezuma, and the Tuzigut National Monument. Then there were the Patayan people, some anthropologists call them the mystery culture because we know very little about them except that they lived along the entire length of the Colorado River, farming in its floodplain and possibly occupying some inland areas as well. Finally, in the southeastern corner of Arizona, from Wilcox to Bisbee and Douglas, there's evidence of a later people living in the earlier Cochise Man territory. We don't know much about them and they have not been given a modern name. So if we take the map of Arizona and overlay all the cultures and civilizations who were here from the 12th to the early 15th centuries, we find that the state was almost completely occupied. Some estimate a population of 100,000 people, and then they were gone. Well, it's not as though they vanished into thin air, as if aliens from outer space got them, but their civilizations ceased to be. Their villages and pueblos were abandoned, they scattered to other parts. And why? We don't know exactly. But there are several plausible theories, and the truth may be a combination of them. Tree ring studies, for example, show that there was a drought several decades long, which was at its worst around the year 1425. Others say that after hundreds of years of farming without the use of fertilizers, the land simply would not grow crops. 
There's the warfare theory, that aggressive tribes from other places invaded and drove the people off. Some pueblos and cliff dwellings are known to have been remodeled with defensive fortifications. It is suggested that with growing populations living in crowded villages, the lack of sanitary facilities gave rise to epidemics. And there's the theory that they used up the trees necessary for fuel and building. In 1901, Harvard anthropologist Frank Russell spent a year with the Pima Indians who told of at least the Hohokam exodus as related in Pima mythology. elder brother was a supernatural being with a troublesome temperament. He went among the Hohokam defiling their young women. Seeking justice, the Hohokam killed him and even dismembered his body four times, but in each case he came back to life. Angry at this ill treatment, elder brother went inside the earth where he found and recruited an army of Pimas who followed him from village to village, killing all of the Hohokam. Later, elder brother retired to the Babakivari Mountains, where presumably he still lives. If I were to say, parlez-vous français, or como esta usted, you may not, especially with my poor accent, understand the words, but you'd likely recognize that I was trying to speak French and Spanish. Our ears are attuned to the sounds of those languages. We'll try these. Couldn't check when Mandamo Havum took a targa, Mamma Mamsha, Edam Kovner Mashma could do it. A pioneer Kayap Itamum, Puita, Tatak Moyen, the Turkai Kayak. In Daga, the Estic and Yaya, how did this issue move said? You understand that? Of course not. See? See the Chigita Yiski. Did you recognize Pima, Hopi, Apache, and Navajo? Probably not. For even though these languages have been spoken in Arizona for 500 to 1,000 years, or maybe longer, we don't know the sounds. Some people think that American Indians speak, quote, the Indian language, end quote, as if there were only one. Actually, in the United States, there are hundreds. 300 years ago in Arizona, to have communicated fairly well, you would have had to have known maybe 10 languages, not counting English and Spanish. To cover all the tribes and sub-tribes, you'd have needed to known closer to 20. Linguistically, they fall into groups with common roots way back in time. Think of them as distant cousins. The Pima words you heard are related to the Hopi, even though today they are separate languages. The Navajo related to the Apache. The Native Americans in Arizona fall into three language groups, and we thought it might be a good approach for showing just how many different and diverse Indian tribes have called Arizona their home. The first group is the Aztec Tenoan. Of course, as the name implies, these seven tribes are linguistically related to the Aztec civilization of Mexico. It includes the Pima Indians, who occupied the upper Gila River Valley, where they farmed and developed fairly large communities. Today, the Pima have three reservations, Ak Chin, which they share with the Tohono O'odham, Salt River, shared with the Maricopas, and the largest, the Gila River Indian community, also shared with the Maricopas. The total Pima population today is around 12,000. Professor John Martin of Arizona State University is an expert on southwestern Indian history. The people we used to call the Papago or the Tohono O'odham were traditionally probably not too much different than the Pimas. They spent the summers in their, um, their valley villages near good farming and near water. And then in the winter, they would go to their well villages in the mountains. In the area of their historic territory, the nearly 20,000 Tohono O'odham have three reservations around Cells, at Gila Bend, and at San Javier, while a small number live with the Pimas at Ak Chen. Until the 1870s, the southern Paiute controlled all of the area north of the Grand Canyon. 
Today, this tribe of only a few hundred lives on the Kaibab Paiute Reservation, which was created in 1907 near the Utah border. A tribe related to the Southern Paiute are the Chimaueves, who in early times migrated east from California to the Colorado River. Part of their reservation was once in Arizona until the changing course of the river put that part under water. Today their land is on the California side, although some Chimaueves live on the nearby Colorado River Reservation. And perhaps at this point we should examine the Colorado River Reservation because it defies the more typical pattern in that it is today the home of four tribal groups, Chimaueves, Hopis, Navajos, and Mojaves. Agriculture and highly developed recreational facilities provide a strong economic resource. Another Aztec Tanoan tribe is the Yaqui, who are believed to be descendants of the ancient Toltecs. Their territory was in northern Mexico. There may have been 10, 10 to 20, maybe even 30,000 of them uh, up and down the Yaqui River Valley. Um, they were to experience a, a tumultuous contact uh, with the Spanish and later with the Mexicans in which their settlement pattern was totally reorganized and into a town form. Today, totaling perhaps 5,000 in Arizona, the Yaqui have a small reservation called Pasque Yaqui, south of Tucson. Others live in various communities, including Guadalupe, near Tempe. One of the most intriguing tribes in Arizona is the Hopi, numbering perhaps 8,000, who throughout the world are known for their spirit beings, the Kachinas. The Hopi Reservation is essentially the historic territory they've occupied for a thousand years. The village of Old Oribe dates to 1150 AD and is the oldest continuously inhabited community in North America. And then there are the Tiwa, originally from New Mexico. Late in the 17th century, they moved to the Hopi at the village of Hano for security and protection against reprisals by the Spanish after participating in the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Over the years, there has been considerable assimilation with the Hopi, and today the Tiwa are legally members of the Hopi tribe. Before we meet the next tribal group, let's take a look at historic tribal political structure. Now, in no case was there any kind of a supreme chief over all of the tribes, or over all of the members of a given tribe, unless they were all living fairly closely in one compact location. Leadership tended to be at the village level, or of a clan, which you can think of as a group of extended families that lived and traveled as a unit. This widely dispersed leadership structure probably worked against the Indians during the decades of war with the Americans. It also frustrated U.S. military commanders who might have assumed they had negotiated a peace agreement with an entire tribe, only to discover later that the Indian leader they'd been dealing with could speak only for his small band. Some tribes or bands had a political chief and then a separate war chief. Others did not. If they held formal tribal elections in those early days, we haven't heard about them. Leadership just seemed to emerge. Maybe the word chief is not appropriate. They were sort of the first among equals, individuals who spoke well, who commanded moral wisdom, who could articulate moral wisdom, who were brave, that sort of thing. And the words that they used for them, for instance, among the upland humans really reflected that. They were called by names like a man who goes forward, uh, a leader, a boss, a talker, things of that order. The second language family among Arizona Indian tribes is the Yumans, or the Hokan speakers. Well, the Hokan speakers came to Arizona from California probably about the time of Christ. They settled first in the valley of the lower Colorado River. Their population seems to have expanded there. They moved up the Gila River Valley and up the tributaries of the lower Colorado River. That is the Bill Williams Fork into the area around Prescott, um, Chino Valley, and um, over around Jerome, those kinds of areas. And others moved further north. 
There were a people called the Pai, who around 1000 AD moved north from the Colorado River Valley. In time, they separated into three distinct tribes, which are sometimes categorized as the upland humans. The Havasupai, today numbering about 500, have lived for perhaps 700 years at Supai Village, at the bottom of the west end of the Grand Canyon. Known for the spectacular waterfalls of their homeland, the Havasupai's primary income is from tourism. Each year, some 20,000 people visit, arriving either on horseback or by helicopter. The western and southern bands of the Pai have become known as the Wallapai. This tribe of perhaps 2,000 today has a reservation in the high plateaus south and west of the Grand Canyon. The seat of government is at Peach Springs. Aside from tourism, the Wallapai have successful livestock operations. The third group to emerge from the original Pai people are the Yavapai, who despite their ancestral relationship were more allied with certain Apaches and were quite hostile toward the Wallapai and the Havasupai. Originally they settled near modern-day Sedona and dominated the area of the Verde Valley. After hostile engagements with the U.S. military in 1875, they were exiled for 25 years, but allowed in 1901 to return to the Verde Valley, where several hundred now share a reservation with Tonto Apaches. Other Yavapais, along with Mojaves and Apaches, are part of the Fort McDowell Reservation, northeast of Phoenix. There are a few at the Tonto Apache community near Payson and perhaps 120 at the exclusively Yavapai Reservation at Prescott. At the west end of the Pima's Gila River Reservation, near the town of Levine, is the home of the Maricopa Indians. Other Maricopas also live with Pimas at the Salt River Reservation 30 miles away. These people are the descendants, the survivors really, of five tribes of river humans who lived on the lower Colorado in the 18th century. There was a great deal of warfare going on at that time and subsequently. And in the process of this warfare, the Halekwamai and the Kowan joined with the Halchi Doma and moved from the valley, came upriver to the Gila where they joined the Maricopa, or the Coco Maricopa as they were called at that time, who were also joined by the Cavelcha Dome, and they today are known as the Maricopa. These tribes, in a sense, were offered refuge by the Pimas and have been closely associated ever since. Back on the Colorado, one of the tribes that was either more warlike or perhaps just more successful in the intertribal wars was the Quichan. These people were floodplain farmers and along the river lived in villages strung out such that it was difficult to tell where one ended and the next began. They had various conflicts with the Spanish, the Mexicans, and the U.S. military and eventually were settled on their reservation at historic Fort Yuma where today approximately 2,500 Quichan reside. To the north were the Mojaves. They occupied the area near Bullhead City on both sides of the river. Um, they were a numerous tribe, perhaps two to 3,000 people. They were closely allied with the Quichan or the Yumas in the warfare pattern in the Colorado River Valley. The Fort Mojave Reservation, located on their traditional territory, is home to close to 1,000 members. The southernmost of the Hokan language group on the Colorado River is the Cocopa. In a sense, they were a favorite military target of the Quichan and Mojaves, but were generally successful in defending themselves. It's interesting to note that the Cocopa were the only tribe in Arizona who utilized fishing for part of their regular food supply. They were also the first to convert to a wage economy, accepting employment as laborers for many Anglo-owned farms and irrigation companies. In a moment, we'll meet the final language group, but first a few words about the structure of Indian families in early times. Regarding the traditional roles of women and men, there was no one single approach. In some tribes, men played the dominant roles, but in others, the wife was considered the owner of the property and the head of the family, and she would groom a daughter to inherit the position and the valuables. 
Similarly, some tribes were matrilineal and matrilocal. This meant that when the couple got married, the young man would move into his wife's household and from then on would be a member of her family. And there's the matter of names. Ralph Cameron is a Maricopa Indian, born a few years after Arizona became a state, here on the farm where he still lives, on the Gila River Reservation near Levine. What was your family's name, Indian name? We didn't have no family name, just individual names. That was all. Where did you get the name or your family adopt the name Cameron? Oh, that was given to us to the, through the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs because we had Indian names and they were too, too hard for them to pronounce. It was no coincidence that the name Cameron, specifically Ralph Cameron, was that of a U.S. Senator from Arizona at the time. The Bureau of Indian Affairs didn't look far in renaming Indians. My Indian name is Ram Kunek. Ram Kunek means when you move to another place, you become gentle or something like that. The final language group, the Athabascans, do not have ancient roots in Arizona. They arrived about 500 years ago from Alaska by way of Canada to the American Midwest to northern New Mexico and finally Arizona. Here, the linguistic group includes only two tribal names, the Navajo, which is the largest tribe in America, and the Apache, which is certainly one of the most famous. Originally, they were all one people, but became distinct groups by the 1500s when they arrived in Arizona. The Navajo settled in the area which had earlier been the Anasazi homeland, sometimes literally occupying abandoned pueblos, but more often building six-sided, single-room structures of mud and logs called hogans. They did some farming, gathered wild foods, and hunted. Many of the economic practices associated with the Navajo today, jewelry making, weaving, and sheep raising, were adopted in later centuries. Today, the Navajo number at least 175,000 members, and their reservation in Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico covers nearly 15 million acres, completely surrounding the Hopi reservation. The Apaches came into Arizona about when the Navajos did, but during that time frame, or perhaps earlier, the Apaches separated into at least four groups. The Western and Chiricahua Apaches in Arizona, the Muscalero and Hikaria Apaches in New Mexico. In East Central Arizona were the Western Apaches, made up of various sub-tribes, which were later given such names as White Mountain, San Carlos, Sibiquiu, Southern and Northern Tonto, and Aravaipa. Each of these regional bands had autonomous leadership, and engaged in some, but not an excessive amount of hostilities against the Spanish, Mexicans, and Americans. The Western Apaches farmed, gathered, and hunted, and established somewhat permanent living sites. Today they live on three reservations, Fort Apache, which includes the beautiful White Mountain area, San Carlos, immediately to the south, as well as the very small Tonto Apache Reservation just outside of Payson. Various bands of the Chiricahua Apaches occupied the southeastern corner of Arizona and adjacent parts of Mexico and New Mexico. They were a bit more nomadic than their northern cousins, and as events unfolded, they were far more warlike. Famous leaders such as Cochise, Geronimo, Mangus Colorado, and Victorio were Chiricahua Apaches. As we will examine in detail in our second program, the Chiricahuas were, in 1886, removed from Arizona and not allowed to return. Their few descendants today mostly live in Oklahoma and New Mexico. People always want us to behave like the way they do. People always want us to speak a perfect English like the way they do. I look at myself and I say, I don't have to be like them. 
if I feel comfortable using broken English and speaking to you like the way I am now, I feel comfortable with that because that's me. Uh, I'm unique uh, individual, unique person that way. And I don't really have to be like anyone else. I do know that I'm very conscious of where I came from, who my parents were, what my tribe is, what my community was, and the people that I interact with. I was born here, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna die here. I, I always will be Apache. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna be a white man. A white man is not gonna make a white man out of me or, or you know, try to influence me into, into um, some of their belief. But my belief is positive thinking to be, my mother always tell me, or my grandfather or my grandmother, just to be kind to people. Be kind to people, be nice to people. And everybody's trying to find their identity. Everybody's trying to uh, tell other people who they are. And I believe this is uh, also among the um, Native Americans, that this is what they want, and that's what they want the people to, to realize and to understand. In our travels and research, we've observed that Native Americans take a great deal of pride in their identity. The white man's not going to make a white man out of me, said Apache historian Edgar Perry. And at the same time, there are many white people who have a great fascination with the Indian, especially in regard to native spirituality. There are as many Indian belief systems as there are tribal groups. It's said that in some native languages there is no separate word for religion because religion as we might think of it is not a separate thing. It's part of life. Some of these roots lie in the historic and prehistoric struggle for survival. Dr. Donald Barr of Arizona State University. I'd say that any religion has got uh, two big parts to it. One is about the, the calendar of the year and the second one is about really the calendar of people's lives or of their whole lifetime, the lifetime of an individual. And we can see that uh, in the native religions here. The year's got its seasons and the seasons are celebrated and celebrated especially for how they have to do with uh, uh, the food that people eat. In a society where providing food took the bulk of one's time and concern, the relationship with nature would be a very high priority and the focus of spiritual life. There are ceremonial offerings that focus on specific seasons or crops, natural events or conditions, asking for spiritual help to survive in the natural world. Mankind is part of that world, not necessarily the master of it. He must live in balance with the things around him. It is common within Native American belief systems for an individual to reach out to communicate with ancestors as well as other spiritual forces. And some ceremonial activities are viewed as more than just symbolic. For example, it is believed that a sand painting of a particular god is not just a picture of that god, it is the god, there for the benefit of all present. Some tribes, particularly those with permanent homes like the 900-year-old Hopi villages, utilize spiritual facilities called kivas. Emery Sekakwaptua. They've been able to have uh, develop uh, a social system of community that carries them into uh, institutionalized uh, structures in, for various purposes, and particularly with having religious purposes. Other tribes never did use permanent facilities. Sometimes people and native peoples make a point of having a religious event and uh, uh, where everybody that's outside and everybody uh, you know gathers and does it and it's very holy. This lack of a permanent religious site, according to Dr. Barr, sometimes led non-Indian people to mistakenly conclude that Native Americans didn't have a real religion. 
To us, to our people, it's gigantically important. You don't have a, religion is church. You don't have a religion unless you have a church to go to. And we think of a church in a very kind of concrete sense. Here's the, here's the church and here's the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. That's church. The spiritual focal point in many native religions is the shaman or the medicine man. Although he may perform services for the benefit of the entire tribe or clan, sometimes sensing the future through dreams, often the shaman is called upon to help individuals. They can uh, uh, transmit power or strength into the person. They can suck uh, bad stuff out of the person. A unique <clears throat> special power that they have. A power to, to affect somebody else's soul, not just to know what's what with somebody's soul, but to be able to change what's what about somebody's soul. I would date the earliest start to around 7,000 B.C. Some of those baskets are dated very, very early from the caves, the deep caves. And of course, they're not completely preserved, but they are quite well preserved in parts, fragments. Clara Lee Tanner is one of the world's foremost authorities on southwestern Native American art. The author of many books on the subject, she taught at the University of Arizona for more than 50 years. We say that we think that they felt the necessity for decorating, that they themselves had a, a spirit, a desire to have things attractive beyond the uh, use value of whatever the object may have had. So this is strictly guesswork on the part of archaeologists. But I think we have enough examples still existing in the Southwest, in any part of the world where we have more primitive peoples. We have enough material to tell us why. And I think the basic answer is man decorated his tools, his weapons, his implements, and when he began to wear clothes, his garments, he decorated these things because he felt a need for something beyond the mere little apron which he wore or the basket which she used about the uh, uh, fire, fire where they lived <clears throat> or whatever the thing may have been. There was something in man, and we see it the world around. Uh, there was something in man which demanded an expression uh, beyond strictly utility value. Decoration, of course, never, never helped uh, use value, never interfered with use value. Definitely, it never interfered because the basic material, man had to supply himself with everything he had in early years. Therefore, he could not uh, do any more than he had time for. Nonetheless, we cannot go back beyond the time when man was decorating his earliest baskets, his first pottery, and all all things of like nature. To the south of Arizona, in what today is Mexico, Central and South America, there had developed civilizations which by many measures were even more advanced than the Hohokam and Anasazi. The Aztecs, Incas, Mayans, Toltecs and others had highly developed lifestyles. And I wonder on that day in AD 1519, who saw it first, a dot on the horizon, one, then another, and another, like nothing they'd seen before ships, Spanish ships, then men, light-skinned, dressed strange in shiny metal, speaking a different tongue, carrying a different attitude. They came not to visit, but to conquer. A civilization at least 10,000 years in the making, with a single moment of Spanish boot touching the sand, 
was deemed obsolete of no further use. Native Americans, North, Central, and South, standing in the path of European culture and ambitions, became merely an obstacle, an irritation necessary to be discarded. It took Hernan Cortez and succeeding Spanish conquistadors only months in some cases, a few years in others, to defeat and enslave the Aztecs, Incas, Mayans, Toltecs. It was the first chapter of a story which in both military and political terms would continue for another 400 years and beyond. And that violent story will be the focus of our next program. I'm Bill McCune. Take care. In the early days of cowboy and Indian movies, the action and adventure was often enhanced by making the size of battles several times what they'd been in real life. Often the movie extras playing the marauding warriors were the grandsons and great-grandsons of Indians who had in fact fought in the Old West. But when the script called for an Indian good guy, the part was played by a white man. Typically, Indians were portrayed as mean and reckless. They were almost never portrayed as individuals raising children and working to sustain themselves. They were just there, hiding behind a rock, waiting to scalp you. Well, if there's a point to remember in this program, it's that it is seldom safe to generalize. Historically, there have been at least 20 identifiable Indian groups in Arizona. 16 survive today. Some are no more related than a Ukrainian is to a Brazilian but they did have common experiences, especially as other cultures came along. This program is about war that involved Native Americans in and around Arizona. As with all wars, there are heroes and scoundrels on all sides, and there's much misunderstanding about who did what to whom and why. We mentioned scalping, for example. Some tribes did not do that at all. To others, it had spiritual significance. With the proper ceremony, the warrior gained the wisdom, strength, and courage of the enemy he'd slain. He might also spend several days in isolation, fasting and praying to purify his soul. When scalping was done by non-Indians, which it was, it tended to be an economic thing. In 1837, the government of Sonora, Mexico paid a bounty for Apache scalps. That was until the authorities finally figured out that they really couldn't tell the difference between the scalp of an Apache or that of some other unfortunate Indian. Hello, I'm Bill McCune. In this program, we hope to explore history as accurately as possible and to offer some perspective on the people and the events that took place in this place that came to be known as Arizona. By the time the Americans arrived in the Southwest, Indian people had already experienced some 327 years of foreign conflict with the Spanish, then the Mexicans. But to tell the whole story, we have to examine some lesser known history. Dr. Bernard Fontana. Sometimes we have the notion that before uh, Europeans arrived that Indians were completely peaceful and that there was no warfare. When as a matter of fact, there's plenty of evidence that uh, Native Americans are no different than human beings all over the world, that, that, uh, that indeed there was uh, warfare uh, between 
uh, tribes uh, and among tribes uh, for all of the usual kinds of reasons. The purposes and objectives of intertribal fighting varied. Mark Santiago. There were, there were actually two kinds of, of, of battles. One, raids uh, designed to acquire booty, and uh, vengeance raids, essentially uh, going out to uh, destroy uh, the enemy, to kill as many as possible. Sometimes raiding led to serious intertribal warfare. Uh, each raid would leave uh, numbers of dead, which would require a vendetta, which would require uh, uh, a response uh, so that each uh, attack by one uh, group in the Confederation uh, demanded a response from the rest so that uh, you had a, a literally a vicious cycle emerge. One such vicious cycle, lasting maybe 300 years, involved the tribes of the Colorado River. The Mojave became enemies to the Hachihome, who were enemies of the Quichan, who were enemies of the Kiwan, the Holoquami, the Kelchidome, and the Kokopa. Military alliances developed, the Mojave and Quichan against everybody else. The evidence would suggest that the fighting was not just economic raiding. Not only was it fairly easy to grow crops there, but you were assured good hunting and gathering because of the rich environment. Uh, and the upshot seems to have been that males in those particular societies put it more simply, had a lot of time on their hands. Those particular societies evolved a warfare uh, mentality, so that there were uh, highly organized uh, groups of men uh, who made it their business to fight. Over a period of a hundred years or more, the Quichan Mojave Alliance crushed their enemies, which ceased to exist as tribal entities. Their survivors merged with the Maricopas and moved up the river where they lived as neighbors of the Pimas. But for the next 50 or 100 years, the wars continued long distance, raiders traveling from near modern day Yuma to Casa Grande, 180 miles on foot for a grudge. What's amazing is that in 30 or more instances, when these kinds of fights were picked, uh, always the attacker having to walk a tremendous distance to pick the fight lost and they must have known before they started out that the likelihood of losing was tremendous. The centuries-long conflict finally reached its conclusion in 1857 when a force of at least a hundred Quichan, aided by as many Mojaves, some Yavapais and a handful of Tonto Apaches came together. A man from the Quichan village of Algodonas had had a dream experience, seeing the destruction of their enemy, the Maricopa. Dreams to many tribes were perceived as glimpses of impending reality. Victory was assured. The force started its nine-day walk to the battle site. The Maricopa village lay a half mile west of a solitary hill called Pima Butte, on the south bank of the Gila. To the east lay a string of 10 Pima villages. The raiders arrived at dawn, September 1st, 1857. The first Maricopas they saw, two women and a man, were killed. Hearing the commotion, most other residents began to flee. Women and children are said to have scattered east to the top of Pima Butte. Some men put up a defense and were killed. Others rushed up river, offering warning and seeking help. The Quichan did not chase, but stopped to burn the village to the ground and to celebrate their small but total victory with song and ceremonial dance. Around noon, the Maricopas presented themselves about a half mile away, just below Pima Butte. The Quichan, Mojave, and their allies observed the challenge took up their weapons and moved toward them. Then from around the side of the butte there appeared a force of several hundred Pimas, most on foot, some on horses. Seeing this, most of the Mojaves, Yavapais, and Tontos decided this really wasn't their fight. They turned north, crossed the river, and headed home. No one gave chase. Greatly outnumbered now, the Quichan and some Mojaves nonetheless continued their advance. 
What started as a raid now became ritual warfare, as was sometimes practiced. The opposing armies spread out in long lines facing each other a few yards apart. The Maricopa leader steps forward and issues insults. He calls out, where is the man from Algodonas? I'm here, came the reply. Then as a display of contempt, the Maricopa leader grabs a nearby Quichon and stabs him to death. With this, general chaos ensues as war clubs, lances, and arrows fill the air. It is reported that no firearms were involved in the battle. The Maricopa women and children, still atop Pima Butte, would have had a clear view of the massive face-to-face -face battle. Those few Quichon who tried to escape were trampled by Pima horsemen. It lasted slightly less than half an hour. Some say two, some say six were allowed to get away, to carry the story home to their people. All the rest of the Quichan, and all the Mojaves who had stayed to fight, certainly more than a hundred, were dead. For religious reasons, the Pima and Maricopa would not touch the bodies. Left to lay where they fell, it was reported that many years later, the battle site was still littered with bones and weapons. After the, uh, the battle in 1857, uh, literally a whole generation of the warriors were wiped out. Uh, it was from that point onward that the Quichons were never again a military threat uh, as far as the Americans were concerned uh, or to any other Native Americans. And it turns out that this was the last major battle fought in the American Southwest between opposing forces of Indians. Some Native Americans object to any celebration of Christopher Columbus. Perhaps such protest should be aimed at Hernan Cortez, whose conquistadors in 1519 began destroying the Aztec, Inca, Mayan, and Toltec civilizations, a prelude of things to come. By 1530, New Spain was well established. Some farms came with the legal right to force labor from the Indians who already lived there. James Officer. So long as the Indians were willing to submit themselves to Christianization and, quote, civilization, unquote, then the Spaniards legally could not enslave them. The task of assimilating these people into, quote, civilized Christians, end quote, fell to the priests who established missions. The Indian was expected to work in support of the operation. In return, he received salvation, some material support, and sometimes education. But the fact of the matter is the, the mission system was a very paternalistic system. There were a lot of authoritarian features that many of the Indians were uncomfortable with. Uh, the Mission Indians uh, were really uh, a, or had a high potential really for explosion. And on a number of occasions, they did just that. It was a, an oppressive period from the time of the contact with the Spaniards. In a period of 50 years, uh, it became uh, intolerable. Uh, to the Hopi communities and uh, it apparently was also reaching that point of intolerance among the other pueblos of New Mexico where they also built missions. In 1680 the Hopi and Zuni pueblos successfully revolted. For a hundred years the missionaries tried to return but with no success. There was no, uh, to my knowledge, uh, Nothing that uh, has any meaning in ceremonial practices that is reminiscent of the Spanish period. Another significant rebellion came in November of 1751 among the Pimas. When a Pima leader named Luis was conferred special privileges by the military, certain paternalistic priests were outraged. When they punished Luis for questioning their authority, he organized a rebellion against them. 
It uh, was a kind of warning, I think, to the missionaries and others that the Indians, even the, the peaceable ones, those who had chosen the, the Christian way or seemed to be moving in that direction, uh, also had a considerable potential uh, for dislike of the Spaniards. In the weeks to come, Luis and his followers killed more than a hundred people. Sometimes a single incident represented the final straw, as in 1781. Mark Santiago. The Spaniards had, uh, for many decades, wanted to control the land route to California. They wanted to establish missions in California, Alta California. Um, and the last uh, land uh, obstacle that was in their way, uh, traveling from Sonora to California, was the Yuma Crossing. The Quichan allowed Father Francisco Garces to open two missions. And the Spaniards, uh, although they were attempting to cooperate with the Quichans, tended to expropriate their, uh, the best lands for themselves, uh, to demand labor from the Quichan, uh, and to pasture their animals upon the uh, Quichans' uh, fields. As a result, resentment uh, grew very uh, much as time went on. And by July uh, of 1781, when another group of Spaniards traveling to California stopped at Yuma and began to graze a horse herd of some 300 horses uh, on the Quichon's fields. Uh, it was the last straw. The Quichon's uh, planned a surprise attack uh, for uh, July uh, the 17th of uh, 1781, and they simultaneously attacked both Spanish settlements, uh, and within uh, two days uh, annihilated the settlements, killing over 103 men, women, and children. Several Spanish attempts to recapture the Yuma Crossing were unsuccessful. They were never able to get the influx of people uh, into California that they wanted. And the gold rush that occurred uh, when the Americans were there in 1849 was denied to the Spaniards because of what the Quichans had done in 1781. Can you imagine if the many tribes had been a coordinated fighting force like a modern army? Well, the Yaqui did take that approach. They actually had units of 50 to 200 fighters commanded by officers. They could field an army of from five to 7,000 men. In 1533, slave grabbers came around. They got none. Over the next 80 years, the Spanish army had no success fighting the Yaquis. They stopped trying. Between 1610 and 1740, the Yaqui lived in peace. Then they rebelled when the Spanish encroached on their territory. The revolt failed, and the Yaquis were punished. After the Republic of Mexico was created in 1821, the Yaquis tended to get involved in the violent political struggles of the day. Unfortunately, the Yaquis usually backed the losing side, which in the mid-1800s caused the loss of most of their land. If the Yaquis had been, had been able perhaps to stay out of politics a little more uh, during the period, say, between 1825 and uh, uh, the time of the, of the Gadsden Purchase, uh, their situation with the surrounding Mexicans might have been a little bit more comfortable. About the only thing that could draw Mexico's attention to its northern frontier was the Apaches. The Spanish government had often provided food to keep them peaceful, but Mexico had other budget priorities. It was said in the 1850s uh, that, uh, in fact, even earlier in the 1830s, that uh, and no peace uh, can be uh, maintained if the Apaches uh, are hungry. And, uh, and you have to remember that this was a very difficult land to make a living on. Um, the Apaches were often hungry. Mexico's Apache problem was something it would soon share with the United States. It is likely that the first time an Arizona Indian saw an Anglo-American was around 1825 when the first mountain men wandered through. 
more significant contact would have begun August 18, 1846, during the Mexican-American War, when General Stephen W. Kearney and his 1,700-man army marched into Santa Fe. To the Indians, seeing a different flag flying likely meant little. But in Washington, D.C., Indian issues, or, quote, the Indian problem, end quote, was always on the agenda. The Americans took their cue from the British and French with a policy called enclavement, in short, the reservation system. Land given to the tribes, quote, as long as the grasses shall grow and the rivers run, end quote. Sometimes this real estate became valuable. So in 1830, President Andrew Jackson and the Congress passed the Indian Removal Act that took back the land and left the tribes walk to a new reservation in Indian territory. Along the way, 25% of the Choctaws died, as did 3,500 Creeks. The Chickasaws suffered a cholera epidemic. The Cherokees went to court and Chief Justice John Marshall ruled that they didn't have to go. But the U.S. Army was ordered to round up the Cherokees anyway and march them the 800 miles to Indian Territory. Of the 18,000 Cherokee, some 4,000 would die along the way. It would become known as the Trail of Tears. By 1846, Indian Territory was deemed full any new reservations would have to be created where the Indians were found. Meanwhile, in Arizona, the gold rush of 1849 brought thousands of prospectors passing through to California. The establishment of Fort Yuma led to several fights with the Quichon. All of which the Americans lost, were soundly defeated uh, by the Quichon. But Major Heinzelman uh, decided that the way to, since the Quichons were sedentary agriculturalists, the way to defeat them was to attack their food supply. So he set about a scorched earth policy, burning the crops. After two years of food shortages, the Quichon negotiated a truce. The Mojaves gained the attention of Eastern newspapers in 1858 when they attacked a wagon train at the Colorado River. The first group of soldiers to arrive were run off. A month later, a large troop returned, negotiated a peace agreement, and established Fort Mojave. After some armed conflict in the 1860s, the Wallapais were rounded up and held captive at a place called La Paz. There they suffered from heat, disease, and corrupt Indian agents. Later, the survivors were allowed to return to their traditional territory where a reservation was established. The Navajos had long been involved in raiding. In 1851, as a show of strength, the United States built Fort Defiance. The Navajos were not intimidated. In 1858, they showed their contempt by actually attacking Fort Defiance. The military brought in 1,500 reinforcements. When the Civil War started, Fort Defiance was closed. Its troops went to fight elsewhere. The Navajos interpreted this as the army admitting defeat. Initially, Chiricahua Apache leaders Mangus Colorado and Cochise aimed their hate at the Mexicans. Years earlier, when Mexico offered $100 per Apache scalp, a previously trusted prospector blasted Mangus and his friends with a cannon at close range. The only survivor was Mangus Colorado, who spent the rest of his life getting even. Cochise had had a similar experience. What is unique about Cochise is that he was one more of the very few uh, Cherokee Apaches that could bring all the bands together uh, out of respect and uh, for his leadership. Contributing to Cochise's hostility toward Americans was the Bascom Affair. When Cochise denied kidnapping a child in 1860, an army troop led by Lieutenant George Bascom grabbed several Apaches as hostages pending the boy's release. Cochise grabbed several non-Indians as hostages in return. Eventually, his patience worn thin, Cochise killed his hostages. The army responded by hanging theirs. In the next few months, many settlers were killed in Chiricahua raids. By 20 years later, when the boy showed up working as a scout, it had long since been proved that Cochise had had nothing to do with the kidnapping. The Civil War had its impact. 
the troops left. Then on February 28, 1862, the Confederates rode in and claimed Arizona as a territory. John R. Baylor uh, decreed as, a, uh, as the commanding officer of the Confederate Army in Arizona that, uh, that it was his policy to uh, kill as many Apaches as you could, sparing only the children and women in order to sell them to defray the cost of killing the men. The Confederate visit was short-lived. In May of 1862, the Union Army under Colonel James Carleton reoccupied Tucson and declared it a territory of the United States. A few months later, there occurred the famous Battle at Apache Pass. From 400 feet up the mountainsides, 700 Chiricahuas, led by Cochise and Mangus, Colorado, pinned down 126 soldiers. At the battle's end, however, two soldiers, but nearly 60 Apaches were killed. The army had employed weapons the Indians had never seen before, the howitzer cannon, and the infantry's new breech-loading, rapid-firing rifles. The Apaches would never again choose conventional battlefield tactics against the military. It would exclusively be guerrilla warfare. With the Confederates gone, now General Carleton turned his attention to his other passion, crushing the Indians. His policies to round up the uh, Navajos and uh, subjugate them uh, through any means and all means necessary. Colonel Kit Carson has been criticized for conquering the Navajos by burning crops and killing livestock. But General Carleton's instructions had specifically read, quote, male Indians are to be slain wherever they can be found, end quote. Instructions Kit Carson chose to disobey. In the spring of 1864, 8,000 Navajos were marched 350 miles in what is now called the Long Walk to Bosque Redondo, New Mexico. Historian Don Didera. And there the white uh, leaders thought to convert the noble Navajo, the nomadic Navajo, to agriculture on land that wasn't any good in a country that was full of fever. In four years, some 4,000 Navajos died. In 1868, Bosque Redondo was closed. It was simply becoming too expensive to feed the Indians, and, the, and, and budgetary reasons uh, prevailed. They needed to get the Navajos back into a self-sufficiency. To General Sherman, Navajo leader Barboncito spoke eloquently on behalf of his people. And he said to him, I hope to God you will not ask me to go to any country except my own. I would like to go back the same road we came. After we get back to our country, it will brighten up again. And the Navajo will be as happy as the land. Black clouds will rise, and there will be plenty of rain, and corn will grow in abundance, and everything look happy. It must have been a sight to see because they said that uh, the line uh, as they were walking back to what is now Navajo land was 10 miles long and they walked something like 12, 15 miles per day and these were people that didn't have any food. Uh, the only thing that they were able to eat and survive from was what they could find on trees. Uh, rabbits uh, out in the desert and anything that they could, anything that is uh, edible, they were able to find that and that's how they survived. The period saw bloodshed, anger, fear, stupidity, and sometimes wisdom. A Sibiqui Western Apache leader named Miguel, seeking protection, led his people to invite the army to build Fort Apache on their land in 1870. They knew about the Navajos' long walk. They knew that they couldn't win. And they wanted to be accepted as friends, as equals. Peaceful relations followed. The next year, a band of Aravaipa Western Apaches, seeking protection, sought settlement near Camp Grant. 
One night, when the men were gone, a group of Mexicans and Tohono O'odham Indians, led by six Tucson civic leaders, came and quietly murdered 132 women and children. Outraged, President Ulysses S. Grant demanded the culprits be charged with murder. A Tucson jury took 19 minutes to vote not guilty. In the aftermath, President Grant pursued a policy of moral suasion, peacefully negotiating reservation agreements with the tribes. Another important change was the arrival of General George Crook, a professional soldier who neither hated nor looked down on Indians. Riding a mule, he visited tribal leaders and studied the terrain. To defend against guerrilla warfare, he would use guerrilla tactics. His genius was to hire, at full army pay, friendly Indians as scouts. Gold was discovered near the Yavapai and Tonto Apache territory. Peace was impossible, as Indians and prospectors each viewed the other as squatters. Shoot first and ask questions later. Nani Chadi, a Yavapai leader whose band had been raiding for years, bragged his hideout would never be found. In December 1872, scouts led the troops on a precarious climb to positions near a cave high in the cliffs above the Salt River. Called to surrender, the Yavapais jeered. Bullets fired at the entrance from above and below ricocheted inside, killing 57 warriors and 19 women. Three months later, troops killed 33 Tonto Apaches and Yavapais in a battle at Turret Butte. Stories spread that some, whose bodies were never found, leaped to their deaths rather than surrendering. Others contend they more likely just escaped. But soon, 2,300 Yavapais and Tonto Apaches showed up at Camp Verde seeking peace. General Crook promised fair treatment and established a reservation. Between honest negotiations with friendly tribes and effective guerrilla tactics against bands of raiders, the prospects for peace and security on all sides looked good. Then came a disastrous turn of events. In 1875, a new policy from Washington required that all bands of all Apaches, friendly and unfriendly, as well as the Yavapais, be uprooted from their homes and consolidated at San Carlos. The agreements with Miguel and other Western Apache groups, the new Yavapai Tonto Reservation at Verde Valley would all be scrapped. Even the Chiricahuas were eventually brought in. Historians are uncertain, but the great consolidation was either the idea of, or was enthusiastically endorsed by, flamboyant San Carlos agent John Clum, Lori Davison. And didn't realize what he had done. He thought this was a very efficient way to manage Indians, just get them all together in one place. I mean, it works in New York City, and so it's going to work here, too. It was the worst strategic error possible. Not only were people transferred from homes they had chosen to a prison camp atmosphere, but it poured gasoline on the flames of intertribal hostilities. There were old scores to settle. The Western and Chiricahua Apaches were not always friendly with each other. Men who had been army scouts were now confined with the very men they had tracked and fought. General Crook was so outraged at the policy, he demanded and got reassigned to another state. One band of Western Apaches had been allowed to stay at Fort Apache. The others so resented it that when they finally were allowed to go home, there was a bloody feud lasting for years that killed many tribal leaders, including Miguel. Miguel is the one who greeted, it was his people who greeted the first soldiers to come up into the White Mountains. Um, he, he went the extra mile and then some to be a friend, a man of honor and integrity, and he gave his life for it. Agent John Clum resigned in July 1877 to go and edit the Tombstone Epitaph. From that southwestern Arizona location, he would view the effects of consolidation. As just one example, a Chiricahua leader named Victorio jumped the reservation with 300 followers. His ability to um, attack and to retreat um, and 
survive uh, again and again against overpowering odds uh, is uh, and over a number of years uh, is manifold and uh, is deserving of his abilities as a strategist, as a warrior. It is said Victorio's band killed 1,000 people in Arizona and Sonora before he was killed himself by Mexican troops. Other breakaway bands created similar havoc. In 1881, a Sibiqui Western Apache named Nakedo Klein was impressed with the Christian belief in resurrection. Combining that with Apache religion, he forecast the resurrection and return of leaders like Miguel, who had been killed in the feud. A growing number of his followers began what has come to be known as ghost dancing. Perhaps overreacting, the agent at San Carlos ordered Nakedo Klein's arrest. He sent troops and Apache scouts, ironically from the medicine man's own tribe. In the fight that ensued, several soldiers and Sibicues, including the medicine man, were killed. At least some of the Apache scouts had mutinied and fired on the soldiers. Later, three would be convicted of treason and hanged. For a year following the Battle of Sibicu, a warrior named Natiatish led a band on numerous bloody raids around the Tano Basin. This ended with the Battle of Big Dry Wash in July of 1882, where Natiatish and 20 followers were killed. The only Indian conflict still to be resolved in Arizona would be with Geronimo. But Laurie Davison offers a final thought on those like Miguel and others who tried to protect their people. You need to go back to that original, the friendship, the years that went into building it up. And, and, and these men put their lives on the line. That we, yes, you're, we, we're going to be friends. We are going to cooperate. We're going to do whatever we have to do to move into it, an, another man's world, learn his culture, learn his language, and succeed in that world. This is what they were doing. And they've never gotten any recognition for that. They've never, everybody, um, everybody talks about Geronimo, who fought and fought and fought until he ended up responsible for the deaths of hundreds and hundreds of his people and of ultimately their banishment. And yet these chiefs who fought so hard to save their people, nobody knows their names. It's hard to know whether to view the Chiricahua as ruthless killers, rebels without a realistic cause, or to see them as people willing to pay any price for the cause of their freedom. Maybe both. Many died at their hands. Many of them died in the process. In the end, they lost everything, their home, their freedom, even their name. What remains is their legend. When I was young, I walked all over this country, east and west, and saw no other people than the Apaches. After many summers, I walked again and found another race of people had come to take it. And how was it? Why is it that the Apaches wait to die, that they carry their lives on their fingernails? They roam all over the hills and plains and want the heavens to fall on them. The Apaches were once a great nation, they are now but few, and because of this, they want to die. The Oratory of Cochise before his natural death in 1874. Mangus Colorado died a decade earlier, murdered by soldiers at a supposed peace conference. After years of fighting, Cochise had developed a trust with a man named Tom Jeffords, who persuaded the old warrior to settle on his own reservation. His final days were peaceful. Cochise's heir was his son Taza. In 1876, Chief Taza agreed to visit Washington, D.C., a common practice to impress such leaders with the size and power of the United States. Unfortunately, during the trip, Taza died. He died. He died of disease. Um, and unfortunately, the Cherokee was back here. Most of them, of course, didn't believe that. They thought that he was taken away and killed. The next in line was Cochise's other son, Nachis. Inexperienced, he deferred much of the leadership role to an older kinsman, who we know as Geronimo. He was born in 1829. He would marry eight times and father eight children. 
In battle, he would be wounded eight times. The name Geronimo might have been less famous, but for the events of 1858. A party of Chiricahuas visited Casquia, Sonora, Mexico, to trade with the merchants. Returning to their encampment, they found that the Mexican army had massacred their families. Geronimo's wife and four children were among the dead. It would mark the beginning of a brutal 28-year vendetta, which at minimum claimed hundreds of lives, and more likely in the thousands. Most victims, though not exclusively, were Mexicans, soldiers and civilians. The following year, 1859, he organized a large-scale retribution raid at Arizpe. Said Geronimo, 45 years later, quote, Eight men rode out from the city to parley with us. These we captured, killed, and scalped. This was to draw the troops from the city, end quote. Four companies of Mexican troops responded. Every soldier was killed. He would lead numerous such raids into Mexico, sometimes with only two or three warriors. Early on, he often failed. Some kinsmen laughed at his ill-fated ventures. Many times, the Mexicans would raid in return, losing some troops, but killing Apaches. Geronimo had his successes. In 1863, a Mexican town saw him coming. They evacuated. The warriors leisurely loaded several wagons with any and everything of value and returned to Arizona. In reading his memoirs, which he dictated in 1906, one can't help but be struck by Geronimo's attitude about killing people. After describing one foray, he nonchalantly adds, quote, During this raid, we killed about 50 Mexicans, end quote. In another instance, he recalls that after stopping at a ranch and killing all of the people, they found nothing worth stealing. His complaint was that it wasted his time. By the 1870s, Geronimo was well known in the Southwest and on occasion raided a mention in the Eastern newspapers. It should be remembered that other raiders like Benito, Loa, Chihuahua, Ulzana, Chato, Mangus, the son of Mangus, Colorado, Victorio, and Nana received attention also. But Geronimo seemed to command a certain fascination, not only among whites, but Indians as well. When the Apaches were all consolidated at San Carlos in 1875, Geronimo refused to come in. Agent John Clum arranged a face-to-face -face meeting with him and his band. Clum, seemingly accompanied by only two or three of his San Carlos Apache police, demanded that Geronimo surrender. Uh, Geronimo uh, uh, scoffed at that and said, if you keep talking like that, we will leave you here for the coyotes. Upon which uh, uh, the tip of John Clum tipped his hat and uh, out came a hundred Apache police with Springfield rifles at the uh, port and uh, pointed it at uh, the Geronimo and his warriors. Geronimo went to San Carlos, was kept in chains for a while, then allowed to join the general reservation populace. Clum had been an honest administrator. When he moved on, conditions at San Carlos deteriorated. Beginning in 1877, various bands ran off and returned to raiding, among them Geronimo. Finally, in 1882, the army responded with the return of General George Crook. George Crook was um, a very fair, very just officer. He was enormously respected by the Apaches. An unusual general, respected the Cherokees greatly, understood their plight, understood the clash of cultures, the clash of values. Crook believed that if he could persuade Geronimo to surrender, the other renegade bands might follow. Again, with the help of Apache scouts, Crook found him. The war chief agreed to give up with the stipulation that he could have some time to gather up his people. Crook spent a nervous three months waiting. Finally, in February 1884, Geronimo and a large following returned to San Carlos. During the next year, Crook's army continued to track and encounter the decreasing number of raiding bands. It was a war of attrition. Some Chiricahuas, tiring of the chase, were giving up. Peace was looking possible. Then in May 1885, it all fell apart. Geronimo, Mangus, Chihuahua, Nana, Nachis, and more than a hundred followers 
jumped the reservation, went back to Mexico, and back to raiding. It's important to remember that several hundred Chiricahuas stayed peacefully on the reservation. Whatever their feelings about Geronimo, they wanted no more of the fugitive lifestyle. Some such Chiricahuas were in fact employed as army scouts, a job requiring an oath of allegiance to the United States. With Crook and his troops, they finally met up with Geronimo in March 1886. In a meeting captured on film at Canyon de los Embudos, he and 110 followers surrendered. The next day, however, Geronimo and 25 others changed their minds and slipped away. Perhaps to Crook it was just another small setback in a story with a totally predictable ending. But in Washington, General Philip Sheridan was outraged. He seemed to blame Geronimo's vanishing act on the very scouts who had found him. Sheridan insisted that the scouts be disbanded, that more conventional methods be employed. Crook resigned and was replaced by a politically ambitious General Nelson Miles. If Sheridan didn't want Apache scouts, that's what he wouldn't get. Virtually all of the Chiricahuas living peacefully on the reservation, including the scouts who were technically U.S. soldiers, were suddenly declared prisoners of war and were shipped to prisons first in Alabama, then Florida. General Miles' conventional methods saw 5,000 U.S. soldiers, one-fourth of the U.S. Army, plus 4,000 Mexican troops scouring the desert month after month, failing to find Geronimo and his last 25 followers. Ironically, it was two of the few remaining Apache scouts, Cayeta and Martin, working with Lieutenant Charles Gatewood, who on September 4, 1886, convinced Geronimo to negotiate terms of surrender. They were to be sent east for two years, after which all the Chiricahuas were to be returned to Arizona to live in peace. Two years became a 28-year exile in Oklahoma with the official status of prisoner of war. During his years of confinement, Geronimo farmed and raised a few cattle, joined and was baptized in the Dutch Reformed Church, although later he was reportedly expelled for his incessant gambling. In time, he was allowed to benefit from his celebrity. He toured for a period with a Wild West show and appeared at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. He died at age 80 in 1909. The Chiricahuas remained prisoners of war until 1913, at which time the few hundred survivors were given the choice of living in Oklahoma as private citizens or moving to the Muscalero Apache Reservation in New Mexico. A return to Arizona was not an option. Most chose New Mexico. In 1953, the federal government declared their survivors to be officially Muscalero Apaches. Legally, the Chiricahuas ceased to exist. And it brings to mind words spoken from exile many years before. Geronimo said, we are vanishing from the earth, yet I cannot think we are useless or that God would not have created us. For each tribe of men God created, he also made a home. When they are taken from these homes, they sicken and die. How long will it be until it is said, there are no more Apaches?
When the last 25 Chiricahua Apaches, followers of Geronimo, finally surrendered late in 1886, the American nation breathed a sigh of relief that armed conflict with the Indians had come to an end. Not quite. Four years later, at Pine Ridge, South Dakota, a band of Sioux Indians, led by a chief named Bigfoot, were in effect arrested and held under guard at a camp on Wounded Knee Creek. Under circumstances amazingly similar to Arizona's Battle of Sibiqui some years earlier, the local Indian reservation agents had fearfully overreacted to the band's spiritual practice that had come to be known as ghost dancing. An altercation occurred when the soldiers began to search for weapons. A shot was heard. Having surrounded the camp, the troops opened up with artillery and rifles. There would be no ceasefire. Those who resisted were killed. Those who tried to escape the barrage were chased down and killed. By day's end, 300 Sioux Indians, as well as 25 soldiers, lay dead in the snow. Now, the Indian Wars were over. In the 1880s and 90s, the United States government pursued a policy that was, in a real sense, aimed at doing away with these entities called Indian tribes, and in time, to change these individuals known as Indians into red-blooded, real Americans. In fairness, we have to look at history in the context of its time. Some policymakers viewed Indians as a defeated enemy deserving no mercy, Others felt compassion for the tribal societies. They wanted to do the right thing by them. Perhaps they simply didn't know what that right thing might be. Hello, I'm Bill McCune. In this final program of our three-part series, we will see the century-long struggle of a government trying to find an appropriate Indian policy and the century-long struggle of Indians to enjoy the fruits of American life while retaining their identity and self-determination. In many ways, it was a continuation of the Indian Wars, but now fought not on the battlefield, but in the Congress, the White House, the law firms, the courtrooms, and the real estate offices. And it's probably safe to offer the opinion that on these more genteel, legalistic battlefields during that first two-thirds of the 20th century, the American Indian had about as much chance of winning as did his grandfather at Wounded Knee. We'll give Senator Henry L. Dawes the benefit of the doubt and assume he was trying to do the right thing in 1887 when he sponsored the General Allotment Act. In 1887, Indian reservations in the United States totaled 139 million acres of land, about equal to the size of Arizona and New Mexico combined. The land was not actually owned by the tribes, but held in trust by the federal government for tribal use. Well, reasoned Senator Dawes, what better way was there to civilize these people than through the ownership of private property? The law would allot to each Indian his own piece of land. In Arizona, the parcels were small. Here at Gila River, you got two 10-acre parcels of land. One of the 10-acre parcels of land was fairly close to the river and had a water right. Uh, the other 10 was away from the water and did not have a water right, and th those are important, as you know, here in Arizona. 10 acres of land back in 1887, or as it, when they were allotting out here in 1921 through 1927, was not going to provide uh, subsistence for a family then or now. Land that was left over after each member got his allotment, the government sold off, usually to non-Indians. Before long, it was made easy for an Indian to sell his allotment. Across the country, real estate speculators were quick to make deals with tribal members, many of whom were uneducated, most of whom knew nothing of land values. The net result of the General Allotment Act was that between 1887 and 1934, the total amount of tribal land in the United States went from 139 million acres to 48 million acres, a net dispossession of 91 million acres, or nearly two-thirds of the total, transferred from Indian to non-Indian hands. In the West, 
Water rights has always been a point of contention. Such disputes between Indians and Anglos is part of the story. The Pimas and Maricopas are basically agrarian people. And uh, since time immemorial, for thousands of years, Pimas and Maricopas have farmed the Gila River Valley. And they depended upon the flow of water from the Gila River. Uh, when, <clears throat> when the state of Arizona began to be populated, um, uh, there were a lot of diversions upstream from this reservation up on the Gila River. And uh, it began to be cause a problem because obviously uh, Pimas and Maricopas began to receive less and less water. It was a tremendous blow to the economy. In fact, so undermined the economy, it ruined the economy. And by uh, the 1900s, it was clear uh, these are reports from the Indian agents out here at Pima Agency, which clearly uh, protested and demonstrated that, uh, that farms were going under here simply because of lack of water, causing a lot of poverty and destitution which persisted on into the 20th century. One way in which it was thought to uh, save water, uh, to store water, to preserve water, and to distribute water equally was to build Coolidge Dam. Uh, in fact, the legislation enacted by Congress in 1924 says specifically the water stored behind Coolidge Dam is to be first for uh, use on the Gila River Indian Reservation uh, by Pimas uh, and Maricopas. Uh, the water was uh, designed to serve both Indians on the Gila River Indian Reservation and uh, a like number of acres off the reservations. Well, the water simply was not distributed equally how that water is allocated, how it's distributed, how it's divided, uh, are, have been, <coughs> uh, are tremendous bones of contention which are now in litigation. It's not our purpose to examine in detail the historical arguments over allocation of Gila River water, but rather to illustrate the kind of issues and challenges faced by tribal attorneys and their governing bodies. And of equal importance, to demonstrate how tribal leaders sometimes feel that they and their concerns are viewed by the larger society. I think that clearly was the attitude that Indians generally in Arizona simply didn't matter and they simply felt they didn't exist and they felt that it would be, would be better simply to avoid dealing with Indians. It, it simply was more than benign neglect. It was, I think, pure racism. The fact that uh, <coughs> Indians at Gila River, Pimas, and Maricopa simply didn't count. And I think every Indian tribe in the state shares this experience between this tribe, the state of Arizona, off uh, non-Indians who live off the reservation, and of course dealing with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, and the Department of Interior. It's, it's an incredible mix of, I think, forces which uh, caused the poverty and the depression, uh, economic depression that exists here at Hill River. And uh, it just seems to me that every reservation in Arizona probably has a similar story of uh, natural resources being diverted for the benefit of non-Indians who live off the reservation and simply being neglected by both the federal and state government in, in attempting to work out an economy which would benefit both Indians and non-Indians. Today, an Indian child whose primary residence is on the reservation will attend a school operated typically by one of four entities the tribal government, the state, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or in some cases, missionary organizations. As with their urban non-Indian counterparts, the quality of education is dependent upon the tax and revenue base and appropriations from their governing jurisdictions. I have yet to see a full funding from the U.S. government for the Indian schools. And I'm only, and I'm talking about the Hopi Reservation. I'm talking about other Indian reservations because I know I travel around, I talk with other tribes about education. That's where the problem is. That's where our most need is. Each year, thousands of American Indian children graduate high school. Each year, like their non-Indian counterparts, too many drop out. But each year, more go on to college than the year before. The history of Indian education cannot be separated from the history of government policy toward Indians. 
Back in the 1860s, the attitude was that there were three options. Number one, kill them. Number two, isolate them on reservations. Or number three, assimilate them, make them part of society. Early reservations were often little more than prisons without walls, where administrators maintained stern discipline while offering such vocational training as farming, horseshoeing, and carpentry. There was little or no contact with the outside world, yet they were somehow supposed to become models of a Western civilization which the Europeans had taken more than 30 centuries to develop. As early as 1865, the government contracted with churches to educate Indians. Initially, under President Grant, the Quakers had a virtual veto power over the appointment of reservation agents. Later, a variety of denominations were involved in training programs, receiving $75 per pupil. The late 1880s began a trend of developing off-reservation Indian boarding schools, exemplified by the Phoenix Indian School, opened in 1892. Congress deemed that school attendance would be mandatory. Thousands of young Indian children were forcibly removed from their families and sent to boarding schools. It was seen as the most efficient way to turn Indian children into non-Indian adults, right down to the haircut. Students did come away educated in reading, writing, history, and mathematics, and some understanding of life in white society. Still, the reality was that an Indian wasn't very likely to be hired for a skilled or semi-skilled job anyway. Most chose to return to the reservation. In the early 1920s, Ralph Cameron, a Maricopa Indian, began his education at a school on the reservation. And when I went there, they kind of forced me around. They, the things, they wouldn't allow us to talk in our own language there, but I have to say something. And the other kids, the children that were there, did not understand uh, the English language either. So they punished us for that. They slapped us around kicked us around, whipped us for that. And I happened to be born too close to the Indian War, so they still hate, had hatred for us. So they took it out on me for no reason at all. I didn't have no part in it, but that's the way it was. And it was very strict, very strict. And I, I, I feared to go to school, going to school. But now it's different. At the fourth grade, Ralph Cameron was sent to Phoenix Indian Boarding School. I left my home, and that was the most heartbreaking uh, experience that I ever had, especially to get away from my, my grandfather, whom I used to go to every night and ask him for songs and stories. And there, with all that peace and love and care, I went to sleep under that, and I was happy. My father and mother were together, brothers and sisters. We were all one big family. But the Bureau of Indian Affairs says that I must go and attend that Indian school and stay away for nine months. So I did. And it was a heartbreaking affair because I cried myself to sleep for about a week, I guess. And I knew that my grandfather back here had did the same thing. The whole household was brokenhearted over it because this is something that is not done in the Indian homes. Students were expected to carry their own weight. I had to do a grown-up man's work for my, my boarding room. I had to work for it. They didn't hire no, to, no professional workers to do like carpentry or masonry work. And I remember at the age of 10, it was cold then in the winter time, and we were built, uh, adding to a new dining room, and I had to carry bricks. And it was so cold, they didn't furnish us gloves, and it seemed like I left part of my skin on that cold brick there. In the late 1950s, when Peterson Za was a student at the same school, some things hadn't changed. I remember uh, Indian language was forbidden. I remember where everyone was required to go to church. 
if they didn't believe in a Christian, any, a Christian church, and if they didn't believe in one of those Christian churches, you know, then you were punished for it. Uh, every Sunday morning, uh, people were required to go, and those that didn't go had to uh, scrub out the whole uh, boys' dormitory, and uh, that meant that you had to work for the whole day so that your liberty was uh, taken away from you. And I remember my personal experience where uh, coming from a traditional family without having much uh, prior schooling, uh, using the Navajo language to communicate with other kids that I was uh, punished for that. And the punishment came in form of having to uh, stay on weekends and not allowed to uh, get out of my room. And uh, that was a, a punishment that was given to me uh, for talking Navajo. Ralph Cameron thinks of those early days and remembers the advice received from his tribal people. They told us that we are a conquered people. We are conquered by the white, white man. And he said, but don't give up because you're conquered. Turn around and use his skills and his learning. He says, that way you will have a better life. It's just like swimming upstream. There's going to be some swift currents where you'll have to really pump uh, water, you know, uh, swim hard. But there will be places like pools where it's calm. But then another thing they tell us is don't be like the, the, the white man, heart. Be, keep all your Indianness in you, your patience, your concern for your people, for nature also, and also endurance. All those things, keep those things, be an Indian, that's what they tell us. So that helped me a lot. And this postscript. Upon graduating from Phoenix Indian High School in 1936, Cameron joined the largely Indian and Hispanic Company F of the 158th Arizona National Guard. Known as the Bushmasters during World War II, General Douglas MacArthur described the 158th as the deadliest fighting force in the Army. And that was our first taste of war. And from then on, we went on up, island hopping here and there. Went to the, then we ended up in um, the Philippines, Luzon area. We invaded that place. I think we took part in about five major battles and in, uh, in the beach landings. When we first made that, uh, that battle on the island of New Britain, we lost about four or five Indian boys from the Indian school there. And they were from Arizona. And then on up the line, we did lose some more. But it seemed like, uh, I always said this, that my grandfather's teaching down here was what gave me the uh, preparation for those years coming. And I learned when I went out there where the dangers are. And uh, like a lot of these birds uh, can give you a warning of if, if there's an enemy around or a non-enemy. And I knew that already. And that, you know, I got by pretty, pretty well that way. And I knew what was out, uh, out there. You came home? Yes, uh-huh. Were you ever hit, wounded? I got wounded on my right arm here, but it wasn't that severe. I didn't lose an arm or anything, but I was, I was, um, I couldn't lift my arm up, and if I stayed out longer, I guess maybe they would have cut it off or something like that. So you got but, your purple heart. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the belief came to be very strong that to get rid of the, quote, Indian problem, uh, that Indians needed to cut their hair, they needed to wear three-piece suits, they needed to have 40 acres and a mule, they needed to have uh, that, that wonderful feeling that comes with the, the private ownership of property, uh, and that somehow if all of those kinds of changes could be made, they would be citizens just like anybody else and we wouldn't have to worry about Indians any longer. Forced assimilation of Indians into the white culture simply didn't happen. And not surprisingly, even if government policies and programs had been perfectly planned and well-funded, which they weren't, racial prejudices would have been a stumbling block. 
What was nearly accomplished was the destruction of Native American culture. Of course, Indian language and religion were early targets, but another victim was the viability, the leadership component of the tribes themselves. Spiritual leaders and experienced elders were turned to for guidance. Group actions were likely the result of persuasion rather than enforced rules. The early reservations undid this tradition. Rules were rules. Indians as individuals were to obey. The tribal concept was undermined in the assimilation effort. And people actually looked on the appointment, getting an appointment as an Indian agent as a kind of political plum because the Indian agent uh, in those early years was like a king on his own reservation. He could control the contracts uh, for feeding Indians uh, with beef supplies and all of the rest, and there was a tremendous amount of graft. By the 1920s, the problem and expense wasn't from theft, but bureaucracy. The Federal Office of Indian Affairs had divisions and subdivisions, field offices and Washington bureaus enough, some said, to employ all the bureaucrats' friends and family. Still, for all the money and manpower, it was questionable how much benefit was filtering down to the average Indian. Finally, after 40 years and a series of both private and congressional studies, the government deemed the philosophy and policy of forced assimilation a failure. There would be a whole new approach. Maybe it would be better, after all, to let Indians be Indians. So with the New Deal of President Franklin Roosevelt came new policies with an emphasis on the viability of cultural units and the concept of tribal government. All of a sudden they turn around and say, okay, now set up a government. And it's not just set up your own kind of government, but set up one of our kinds of governments. When you look at the constitutions that were enacted by the tribes under the Indian Reorganization Act, um, even though those constitutions were formally adopted by the tribal, uh, the tribal members, uh, they were written by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and they were on an Anglo model. The Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 brought at least officially an element of choice and decision making to the tribes, something that had been missing since the early 1870s. The dilemma was that tribes, the new tribal governments, individuals in official positions, often were not trained nor experienced enough to make legislative decisions or to administer programs. Waiting in the wings, of course, was the Bureau of Indian Affairs, an army of bureaucrats at the ready, described by some as, quote, stifling father figures who treated Indians as children, end quote. Indeed, under federal law, even the provisions in and adoption of tribal constitutions were subject to the veto of the Secretary of Interior, the illusion of self-government. One Apache tribal chairman summed it up saying, despite their tribal constitution and elected council, the BIA superintendent was, quote, still the boss, end quote. The Indian Reorganization Act did bring with it some new worthwhile programs, most notably the Johnson O'Malley Act, which provided funds for state and private school systems to educate Indian children in integrated schools. Some other well-intentioned new programs were aimed at protecting Indian lands against erosion, deforestation, and overgrazing. The downside of these efforts was that all the key decisions were made not by the new tribal governments, but by the Department of Interior. The Indian New Deal, as it was called, continued for nearly a decade, until the outbreak of World War II, when government spending followed other priorities. But here it's worthwhile to comment on the participation of Indians in that war. We've mentioned the 158th Arizona National Guard Bushmasters, of which Ralph Cameron and other Arizona Indians were members. Of course, in the pre-war 1930s when they joined up, Company F was the unit to which racial minorities were assigned. During the war, the replacement of killed and wounded soldiers changed the complexion of that organization. It is significant that in World War II, more than one-third of all able-bodied American Indian men served in the military. This was several times higher than the proportion of American men as a whole. 
Certain Indians from Arizona gained notoriety. The Navajo code talkers were a secret unit of Marines whose coded communications, based on their native language, were never deciphered by the Japanese. And Ira Hayes, a Pima from the Gila River Reservation, was among those who raised the flag over Mount Sarabachi on the Japanese fortress island of Iwo Jima. In the early 1950s, there was an attempt in Congress at yet another new approach to the relationship between Indians and the federal government. It was called termination. The upshot, perhaps oversimplified, was to do away with reservations and federal involvement with Indians. To the extent, if any, that government would address the special concerns of Indians, it would be by state government. Back in 1912, when Arizona was granted statehood, it had been forced, actually, to agree that Indian matters would exclusively be in the jurisdiction of the federal government. Now it was offered the opportunity to take it back. Perhaps needless to say, neither the state government nor the various tribal governments were much interested in the opportunity. In the late 1960s, government policy toward Indians saw not so much a legislative initiative as a shift in emphasis. The Nixon administration sought to lessen federal control and increase tribal participation in decision making. How sovereign is sovereign? There are those that will tell you that we are not sovereign. There are also those that will tell you that we're quasi-sovereign. The Indian people will say that we're completely sovereign. I like to look at sovereignty as, in terms of definition, it's everything that we are about. It's everything that we do. Sovereignty means everything to the Indian people. People have all kinds of different concepts of sovereignty and do throw that term around a lot of times. I think it means for Indian tribes the ability to make laws and the ability to enforce those laws. The concept of sovereignty historically comes from the United States government having negotiated treaties with sovereign Indian nations. In Arizona, only the Navajo reservation resulted from a treaty. All the others came via presidential executive order or acts of Congress. Still, all tribal governments rely on and sometimes challenge the body of statutory and common law defining the concept of sovereignty. In the early 1990s, disputes with the federal and state governments over tribal-operated casino gaming on reservation land brought the sovereignty issue to public attention. And it's interesting to note that in the midst of those sometimes heated confrontations, public opinion polls showed non-Indian citizens overwhelmingly on the side of the Indian tribes. In other, less publicized situations involving tribal courts, the United States has sought to restrict sovereignty. Paul Binder. We say the tribes are sovereign, um, but there are many, many limitations on that sovereignty, so that sometimes it almost looks to me as if the United States is treating the sovereignty of the tribes the way uh, school authorities treat the sovereignty of student government at the, uh, at the school. I mean, the teachers sit around and watch you do it, but if you get involved in anything they really care about, they come in and tell you what to do. Uh, that obviously is not meaningful sovereignty. But when you restrict, for example, as, as the Supreme Court did, when you restrict Indian tribes to having criminal jurisdiction only over their own members, when it may well be that a majority of people living on the reservation are not tribal members, uh, you really can't expect them to exercise meaningful sovereignty over, over this area when half the people there are people who they have no jurisdiction uh, over. And that's a problem that the United States is going to have to face up to uh, in, in, the, in the coming years. If we really are serious about Indian sovereignty, we've got to be willing to give them more sovereignty than we so far have. Later, the Congress took action to undo the Supreme Court decision, and the dispute continues. In our research for this program, we have discovered that there are a lot of misconceptions, a great deal of misinformation about the day-to-day -day rights and responsibilities of American Indians, and we'd like to touch on a few of those. But first, let us clarify a point about law enforcement. 
Just because tribal courts have limited jurisdiction, it does not mean that you can get away with anything on the reservations. Serious crimes are prosecuted by the federal government. Now as to the misinformation, here are the correct answers. Yes, American Indians are American citizens. Those who were not already citizens were made so universally by an act of Congress in 1924. Yes, Indian tribes in Arizona are permitted under the law to sell liquor on the reservations. Most tribal governments have chosen not to, but given a state license and adherence to state liquor laws, it is permitted. And here are the correct answers to the most often mistaken beliefs. Yes, Indians do pay taxes. Federal income tax, social security tax, state and local sales tax off the reservation, and state income tax on wages, salaries, and profits earned off the reservation. In addition, depending on the actions taken by their tribal councils, they may have to pay taxes to the tribal government as well. And finally, no, American Indians do not receive a monthly check or stipend from the federal government by virtue of simply being an Indian. I know some people believe that, but it just isn't true. Tribal members, like any other citizen, may apply for and qualify for various kinds of public assistance programs or social security or disability or veterans benefits, but there is no automatic Indians-only government stipend. These are a few common misconceptions, and we thought we should just set the record straight. Up to this point in our series, we have covered 15,000 years, from the dawn of civilization on the North American continent up to the present. But what about the present? the standard of living, the health and well-being of native people. Certainly, these topics deserve in-depth documentaries of their own. But in the few minutes we have left, we thought we would at least touch on them through the words of some of the people we've met along the way. Well, there, there is poverty on Indian reservations in Arizona. I think the um, statistics bear that out. I think American Indians are probably on the bottom of the poverty line. If you are a uh, from an Indian tribe that's recognized by the United States government, you can come to one of our facilities and get care, direct care, if we can provide it. If we don't have the services that you need, then if you are on or near a reservation of that facility, then you are eligible for what we call contract health services. And we will pay for a certain portion of that health care that we cannot provide you. In the past, it was a reliance on the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the Indian Health Service or another agency. But once the Indian governments got involved themselves in developing the program or a service, they could uh, structure that service or program according to what would best suit their communities. And I think there's been uh, a great deal of improvement and development in how they go about delivering those services to their community people. Accidents are the number one cause of death in the Indian population, in the Indian Health Service, the, stati the statistics that we have. And most all of these are alcohol-related deaths. Um, there are studies that have been done to try to link this to a genetic uh, predisposition. The, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of concern in the, in the native population about doing research regarding this and so uh, there is no conclusive evidence that it is a genetic predisposition. The reservation is considered a dry um, as far as alcohol is concerned. Uh, we have uh, uh, people uh, coming in with um, with alcohol, uh, uh, liquor, and you know, in all sorts, uh, uh, and and so it's 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 on the reservation, and that it, that includes the uh, drugs and other kinds of uh, um, chemicals uh, that are 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 being uh, abused, and so it's no different from uh, uh, any any other uh, town, I believe. The incidence of diabetes in the non-Indian population ranges between 4 and 5 percent, depending on who you read. In the all-Indian population, U.S., the rate is about 25 to 27 percent. In the Pima Indians here in Arizona, the incidence of diabetes is 56 percent of those age over the age of 35. 
diabetes is, is related to nutrition and related to activity. Uh, there have been some studies done at National Institutes of Health indicating that the Indian population may not burn calories uh, as fast as a non-Indian population. There's a lot of evidence that this is a genetic problem in the Indian population. They may disagree with me, but I think within the next five or ten years they will be able to identify this gene and it will be a significant uh, factor for the Indian population. The main reason people move off the reservation is that they um, aren't really needing a job or that they are in school or perhaps they have other people um, that need some type of, of medical or health care. But it's mostly the job situation that brings a person off the reservation to live in the city. It is very difficult for an Indian tribe to attract, say, a major employer. And it's because, uh, no doubt, because of the trust status of the land, because of an unfamiliarity and fear of tribal governments, what tribal governments will do or won't do, will they pass uh, onerous kinds of legislation which will drain a uh, corporation, will they nationalize what happens, uh, a business which comes onto a reservation, will they tax them out of existence. Uh, those are fears and barriers which have to be overcome and will be overcome eventually. Because lack of education and lack of understanding of uh, economics and uh, industries, the people, individuals that would want to get into the um, industry are lacking some experiences in how to manage um, employment. I see, you know, the progress can be made only if the tribe would allow, you know, personal people who would want to go into business themselves. Yeah. Give them that opportunity, then we won't have this much of the poverty that we have on the reservation. Um, so I, I see uh, a Bureau of Indian Affairs which is going to have to be uh, uh, reduced in size. It should uh, uh, play a, uh, a greater role in providing technical assistance, say, in, for instance, in, in <coughs> water hydrology or in uh, uh, attracting business to a reservation and uh, uh, providing <coughs> uh, opportunities for tribes and, and individuals and tribal enterprises to obtain funds in which to start business, to continue in operation, and, and to set up uh, new ways of providing uh, revenues to tribes. So, I, don't, I just don't see an uh, elimination of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the foreseeable future. And that as long as there is the big brother BIA there, it's almost like the, uh, the teacher who supervises student government in the school, and as long as the teacher is sitting there looking over the shoulder of the officers of the student government, they're never going to be really independent and really sovereign. And it's time to phase that out and recognize that Indians are fully capable of dealing with their own affairs as long as they're given the, the resources to do so. Uh, working with the BIA to me means that you have to be able to make yourself available, make decisions with them, uh, and then have them be able to do things at your guidance and at your calling, rather than having them come in, do things whenever they like, however they want to do and deal with certain issues. And uh, when I first came to PIMC, the Phoenix Indian Medical Center, it was not uncommon for me to ask the family to call in a medicine man uh, for a person who was relatively ill uh, at the time. So I think uh, in our new facilities we are designing a, uh, an area for traditional medicine in all of our new facilities in the Indian Health Service. So we are recognizing the need uh, to include that as part of our health care system. It's not all psychological, believe me. I mean, I've seen uh, some of them work on patients that we thought were, were gone and and they have left the hospital on their own two feet. The outside world's influence is kind of more upon us now. You know, we more tend to try to live the white man's way. It's very hard though, very hard. Everything is uh, commercialized almost. Everything is um, a given. And so there's nothing for some of the kids to do. All they think is now, is trying to get some kind of a um, 
video uh, game place or center or get um, Nintendo games well being a Native American you know like what's even even my Indian world here on my own reservation may be changing from the traditional ways to the modern ways I still you know believe and think like an Indian my patch of ways I haven't forgot the old ways and the way I work with the youth I try to implement a little bit of that into my own little teaching. The kids today, they think that the world has always been like this. They listen to the music, rock and roll. They think they've always been here. Like, uh, they're always like this. And uh, school, basketball, football, McDonald, and, this, and the wall-to-wall -wall carpet in the house, hot water, shower and you know nice clothes tennis shoes michael jackson michael jordan you know <laughs> and the whole thing of the world today but they don't realize that they came out of the wiki up they came out of the wiki up uh that and and a lot of them don't believe that See, is that for real is that we, we live in that that thing yes we came out of there, and we must instill in them where they came from. At the University of Arizona, Emory Sekakwaptua works to preserve Native American culture by developing an English language dictionary of the Hopi language. The years-long effort is dependent upon increasingly sparse financial grants and individual contributions. Being a Native American is a tremendous challenge in the 1990s, as it is with any minority group. I think we are now, with the laws passed by the federal government, we're being given the authority to run our own lives. And I think the tribes that are taking that authority and running with it are doing tremendous things. And it's always the losing end for Native Americans. And the U.S. government has always, you know, shafted the Indians, even the time when we're being put on the reservation. Respect, I, I don't see any, you know, as far as I'm concerned. I, you know, honestly tell you the truth. And there are forces within the state of Arizona that are reaching out and attempting to recognize Indians, to appreciate uh, the, the fact that Indians can be a positive benefit for, for the state of Arizona. And uh, so I feel, I feel optimistic, but it's, it's nothing comes easily in, in Arizona. In Arizona, nothing comes easy, says Rod Lewis, the tribal attorney. Indeed, for Native Americans anywhere, nothing comes easy, nor has it ever. They greeted us on the shore 500 years ago, and we have abused their hospitality ever since. We saw their land, their mountains, their rivers, and we claimed them for our own. Admittedly, that is the repeated saga of all of the world's history. One can argue that though it isn't right, it just is. But this tale is more than just conquest. It wasn't enough to defeat the hostiles, to subjugate the defeated enemy. We had to face the question, what to do with them? It wasn't like a normal war, send the prisoners home and get back to business. Confiscating their homes was what the war was all about. So we adopted them, sort of, the poor relation. Sleep on the porch till we figure out what to do with you. Some said, here's an idea. If there's no room for Indians, we'll make them into white men. Got to get rid of that strange dress and long hair, though. Dump those heathen religions and those languages. There you go. Instant white man. Hmm. Wonder why that didn't work. Oh, well. And why can't these people take care of themselves, said others. We've given them lots of land. Some of it even has water. We've given them tribal self-government, sort of. And we've given them lots of good advice, even made a lot of good decisions for them. Use some of the best minds in Washington, and all they've done is bellyache. Some people are just never satisfied. Well, that's one perspective. For American Indians, nothing comes easy. In election years, American politicians ask, are you better off today than you were four years ago? By most measures, Native Americans are worse off than their ancestors were 400 years ago, and that should be viewed as a national disgrace. 
By nearly every statistical measure, Native Americans enjoy the worst that America has to offer. Poverty, alcoholism, suicide, despair. And why? Some flaw of character, some genetic predisposition? Of course not. Try a litany of failed government policies that might as well have been designed to create these results, though for the most part they weren't. The difficult histories of black people and brown people, orientals and other American minorities have their roots in racism, so too with the American Indian. But add to his burden the misguided actions of a hundred congresses, forty-odd presidents, and countless legislatures. Indians weren't even citizens until 1924. In Arizona, they couldn't even vote until 1948. And yet, traveling this state, talking with Indians of many tribes and stations, it has constantly amazed me to hear their expressions of love of country, of patriotism, of a belief in what this country promises and is still struggling to produce, that being equal opportunity and personal freedom. There is not much in the American Indian's collective experience to warrant such a faith, unless it is some ingrained awareness, a cultural memory perhaps, of what freedom was like way back before their ancestors greeted the white men on the shore. I'm Bill McCune. Take care. Thank you.